Hello everyone, this is Munira Farid from Hive9 and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is not just another pretty marketing plan, five proven steps to building and executing high performance marketing in 2016. Our speakers today I'm excited about are Laura Patterson who is the president of Vision Edge Marketing and Johnny Anderson who is our very own VP of products here at Hive9. We'll have time for questions at the end so please make sure to send your questions along the way through the questions panel and um, we have a hashtag going uh, which is hashtag 2016 marketing plan so um, tweet your thoughts as you go so let's get started with Laura and I will be uh, switching up some slides hello everyone I'm really excited to be here today with the Hive9 folks and this is our, uh, for Vision Edge Marketing, the last webinar of the year, and it's really timely as so many of you are working on your 2016 plans. So we're going to cover a number of uh, things, and uh, per Manira's comment, hope you'll tweet along. So I think it would be helpful for a moment if we could take a step back and try to imagine what we're trying to accomplish. And so I wanted to kind of give you this thought. Imagine that you really could have clear line of sight between the activities in marketing, the investments you're making, and the results you're producing. For many of the folks we work with, this is one of the primary uh, challenges they're trying to address, especially as they move into next year. Imagine you could select the metrics that matter most to the C-suite. Again, we are inundated with metrics. We're drowning in numbers, all of us in marketing today. And so being able to sift through that and identify the ones that are most salient and relevant to the C-suite is pretty critical. Having an actionable dashboard um, that will allow you to make better decisions, that will serve as an effective control panel, help you monitor your performance and manage your risk. And for those of you who are following our content, uh, yesterday's LinkedIn post and today's Measure Up blog on our website both address dashboards from uh, different angles, so you might find that helpful. And lastly, imagine you could use all these things for the very purpose of increasing your relevance, influence, and credibility. Who wouldn't want that? So let's talk about how we accomplish these. And who's doing it well? I think that's an important thing to think about. Are people doing this well? And for some of you, you may be familiar with our annual marketing performance management survey that we've been doing for the last 14 years. And I've pulled up some data from the last seven years. And one of the primary questions we've been asking over the last 14 years is for the C-suite, the CEO, the COO, the general managers, the presidents, the CFO, and others, how they would grade their marketers on their ability to demonstrate and prove their value, contribution, and impact. And they use just traditional scoring, 90 to 100 is an A, uh, 80 to 89 is a B, 70 to 79 is a C, and anything less than 70 falls into the D or lower category. And what you can see here is fairly consistently only a few elite marketers, are really best-in-class marketers, are able to get that A grade. And what we want to be able to talk about is, what do they do better and differently? And if you're really interested in this study, you can learn more about it again on our website, and you can download a free abbreviated summary. But what you see in this um, chart is that the A's are um, holding fairly steady. It's a little slight decline this last year. The B's took a, kind of fell off the cliff and were climbing out and then kind of also took another dip, and the C's overtook them. So many of the B's fell into the C group. We can talk more about why if anyone's interested. And the Ds are climbing. So here we are. All of us have been talking about measurement and metrics and dashboards for years and years and years. And we can see that folks are still quite challenged in being able to do that well. So let's explore what these folks do better and differently. And as we do that, I want to help you understand what you'll be looking at. So we now are able to characterize marketing organizations in three personas. Those A's are value creators. Those B's, the middle of the pack folks, are sales enablers. And the folks that are C's and D's are campaign producers. What, is those, what do those mean? Well, the value creators, they see their job, those marketers, they see their job as being able to create and extract value for the company. They act in a strategic role, and they 
primarily think of themselves as business people first and marketers second. The sales enablers, they primarily see their job as in service to the sales team. I want you to think about that language, in service to the sales team. So not necessarily a partnership uh, relationship, but rather a service provider to the sales organization, predominantly focused on demand gen, leads. We'll talk more about that if you'd like later as well. And the last group are the campaign producers. These are the folks who are extraordinarily talented at producing stuff getting all the things out, the execution, the tactical components of marketing, getting it out on time and on budget. And so these three groups how do things very differently in the, era, in the areas that we're about to talk about. And how do you think the, uh, the leadership team looks at these three groups? Uh, well, if you take a look at the perception of the leadership team for each of these personas, what you'll see is that the value creators are doing a far better job of being able to demonstrate how they impact the business. The campaign producers and the sales enablers have been holding relatively flat. So clearly they're doing something differently. These value creators are doing something differently. And not only are they doing something differently, they're getting different kinds of results. So if you take a look at some of the most important metrics that we've learned from the C-suite that's important to them, revenue growth, marketing contribution to pipeline, win rate, share of wallet, customer retention, and the acquisition of net new customers, you can see that, again that the value creators are far better able to show how they are affecting and impacting those kinds of measures. So think about the kinds of measures you have and whether or not you can show the relationship between the things you're doing and these kinds of results because that's what value creators are able to do. So we know that these best-in-class marketers, these value creators, they do six things very well. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about them, but we're going to only hone in on two today. Alignment, accountability, analytics, automation, alliances, and assessment. Alignment is the ability to have marketing aligned around business outcomes. They're able to show how marketing is in concert, moving in concert, in harmony with what, it, what the business needs in order to declare success. Accountability, that is the um, measures and dashboards of these best-in-class marketers. We know from our research that alignment and accountability are statistically significant. That is the two primary indicators of whether or not a, a marketer will earn the A grade. Analytics. These are the rep, reflect the data, analytics, and modeling capabilities of the marketing organization. Automation is the technology, the processes, the systems, and tools. Not just the technology, but the things that go around it as well. It's the infrastructure, what enables marketing to run uh, like a business. Alliances. These are alliances are very specific. They're formal, explicit, documented relationships. Uh, that the marketers forge with three groups in particular, uh, the sales organization, IT, and finance. And lastly, the A marketers are relentless in their pursuit of continuous improvement. They're constantly benchmarking and auditing and assessing where they are and what they need to do to get better. So the A's, when it comes to their alignment and accountability, they are they know what business outcomes and metrics matter to the C-suite. In fact, they're nearly three times better at it than campaign producers. Doesn't mean they're perfect at it, but they are making strides in being able to understand what's important to this uh, leadership team in terms of outcomes and measures. So I want to ask you a quick question. So we're going to go to a poll and let's see if how, how you uh, might respond to this question compared to the value creators. So have you launched the question? Okay, so the question is, how confident are you that metrics you have in place today connect marketing activity to business outcomes? So one through five. Five, you're extremely confident, confident and one, not very confident. Select one of those. And again, how confident are you that you have the metrics in place today that connect your marketing activity to business outcomes?
We'll give it just a couple more seconds. We're still rolling in. Okay, let's close that poll so we can talk a little bit about it. So here's what we can see, kind of a bell-shaped curve. Um, a few of you are very confident and a few of you are not confident at all and the rest of you are kind of in that two, three, four category, mostly around those threes and twos. So over, um, you know, we're looking at about 65% as twos and threes. So think about that in context of the value creators. They're extremely confident for the most part. Okay, so let's continue on for a moment. Let's talk about how do you get to this alignment. How do you create a direct line of sight? Because that's the first place to start. And there are, the components of direct line of sight are twofold. One, it starts with your marketing plan. For many of you, you're probably working on your marketing plan right now. And the marketing plan, what we often see so many, so many of them actually be, is a PowerPoint or an Excel spreadsheet that comes in with a list of things that marketing is going to do, when they're going to do it, and how much they're going to spend. There may be some objectives around it, such as increase awareness or generate more demand or, um, you know, something like that. Um, many times the PowerPoints, which can range anywhere from a few slides to hundreds of slides, may have some intelligence associated with, like competitive intelligence, customer intelligence, um, maybe some information around the market, all in designed to have some clarity around why they've made some of the decisions. But essentially, it's still a list of things that marketing is going to do, when they're going to do it, and how much they're going to spend. So the key and the difference uh, of the value creators marketing plans is they actually start with business outcomes. They're very quantifiable business outcomes, they're very specific, and then they build marketing objectives that are connected to those. And so it's the demand gen and increased awareness kinds of things don't exist on their plans. And if they are anywhere on their plans, they're much further down uh, uh, on the list of in their plan. The second thing is that they build very tight links between the activities and the investments with the, income, with the outcomes. So those links are very clear. So let's take a look at that. For these marketers, they have some kind of a planning framework. Um, they, re they come to realize that PowerPoint and Excel are not going to get the job done. They're not going to create that visual uh, design that will allow the C-suite to actually see the relationship between the activities and the business results. And so we have an example of a, of a planning framework. There are others out there, and I want to share with you kind of how that might look. So as you can see here, this is just a leg from a company's uh, marketing plan. And so you can see here how they have set up a business outcome. This particular business outcome is around some uh, around a particular vertical where they're going to acquire a specific number of new contacts. contacts. So look at how that's laid out, and it's very clear what the business has to do in order to achieve success. And then underneath that is an objective for marketing. So marketing is going to own discovery meetings, and there's a very, again, clarity around how many of those discovery meetings marketing needs to produce or generate in order to help the organization be successful. So they share this business outcome possibly with sales. And so as the discovery meetings are held, there's a handoff, uh, that will occur with the sales organization that will have a mirrored uh, sales objective connected to this particular vertical. And what you see on this particular example is that this company has got a strategy around personas. People are talking about personas uh, quite a bit right now. So there, this company is going to use personas as they go into this vertical. And then from that, as a result of that persona, persona strategy, they're going to build out programs or campaigns around each of those personas that will lead then to very specific tactics and activities. And this example here are events and uh, how they're going to have a special offer as an activity. So this is just in a one leg. So if we go from there with that planning framework, uh, what you can see is because they have got that direct line of sight and because they've made each one of those uh, st stages or links measurable, they're now able to get their metrics aligned to the business priorities. And so what you can see, again, is how confident uh, marketing is with their metrics are actually aligned to those business priorities, and the value creators are continuing to improve on their confidence level, whereas uh, the 
uh, campaign producers are actually sliding and the sales enablers have been holding steady, not making much progress there at all. Despite all the technology that are at marketers' disposal today in terms of CRM systems, marketing automation systems, marketing resource management systems, and the list goes on. So let's have one more quick, let, no more? So we're going to go into um, how they, what they do. So what they do is they develop outcome-based metrics. And I want to talk a little bit about that because in a moment we're going to share with you a metrics framework. But what's important here is that the metrics of the value creators are slightly different in their orientation than those of their colleagues. So one of the things that's important to note is the difference in the number of, of the orientation toward outcome-based metrics. So in this case, you have activity metrics, which you can see the campaign producers and especially the sales enablers have lots and lots of, but the value creators have far less of. They're not as focused on measuring activity as they are on metrics around outcomes, things such as pipeline contribution, things such as uh, category uh, growth rate, things such as share of preference. Um, some of those outcomes actually tie into beginning becoming leading indicators and predictive. And as a result, because the value creators are better at getting outcome-based metrics, they're able to move up to leading uh, indicator and predictive metrics better than their colleagues. Of course, you can't ignore the fact that you still have to produce outputs and you still have to be operational in nature. So you can see that the value creators and the sales enablers continue to do that well, but you can see on the operational front that the campaign producers are struggling. So what kind of a framework could you use? So this is an example. This is ours, and it's out in the public domain, and you're welcome to use it. Um, you can see that this is a continuum from left to right. So you have activity metrics, which are really about marketing's effort, like the number of articles or blogs posted, or how many tweets you sent out, or how many emails you sent, or the number of events you held, you know, counting uh, your activity. Outcome-based metrics, which are really counting the things that come from that activity, like media mentions, or click-throughs, or open rates, or uh, demo downloads, or website traffic, right? And while those numbers are interesting, when they're reported on the dashboard, which is often what get, is reported, uh, even leads, for example, which is what is reported in the output area, the, the leadership team is asking the question, how does that help me understand the impact you're having on the business? The, the next leg in the continuum is operational. So we need to be efficient. Uh, we have to do this in as efficiently as we can. And there's a lot of folks looking at things like campaign ROI or uh, program to people ratios, uh, marketing spend to revenue, those be operationally oriented. And um, the, once you get there, you have to be very careful. You don't want to stop your metrics here, because if you do, you're going to kind of end up as a hamster on a wheel with a never-ending request by the CFO and the other powers that be to do more with less. And we've all been there before. So how do you, how do you escape that situation? You move to outcome-based metrics. You have to get up to at least that place on the continuum. Not very many companies uh, particularly B2B companies are past that yet, but they're getting there. The value creators are getting there. So get to those business outcome oriented um, metrics such as market share, category ownership, lifetime value, uh, product adoption rates, pipeline contribution are examples. That's not all of them, but that's some of them. Once you get there and you get the data and you start being able to employ analytics, you can move to leading indicators like share of wallet or rate of growth uh, compared to the market's growth rate, or share of preference, and then ultimately to predictive um, analytics and predictive metrics that are based on the ability to build models. So those are the kinds of metrics. Now, the thing that you have to be wary of is there's so many choices. How do you build a really good story from the metrics? Because you could have your metrics be all over the board. So the thing that's important to have is a metrics chain. And the best-in-class marketers use metrics chains very well and they're doing getting better at it and they use their metrics chains to help frame up their dashboards. So what you can see here is that uh, even the A's are, make, are just beginning to make progress here but it's the middle of the pack and the laggards that are really you know way behind, way behind in their journey to creating metrics chains. So what is a metrics chain? What does that mean? So here's an, again an example. So, so this is uh, coming off the plan using the same kind of excellence methodology, a business outcome around market share with product adoption driving that market share, using advocacy as a strategy and having a program associated with that, and then their digital marketing tactics. So you can see it's outcomes to outputs to 
activities, and they define that chain. So when you have that chain, you don't have to worry about all the other things. You just want to be clear in your mind about the relationships of your metrics to each other. And as you build that, right, you now have the, the alignment. You now have the accountability, right, all the way from business outcome down to marketing activity. Your costs are running down at the bottom. Now you're able to actually look at the marketing investments by outcome and see what is working and how well, how effective you're being and whether or not you're driving the right kind of movement for that business needle for the investment that you're making. All right, so this is how they merge the metrics and the plan together to be able to create direct line of sight uh, for the leadership team. Okay, so then, now you have to go from that step to the accountability step and that means creating an actionable marketing dashboard. This is an example of what a dashboard might look like uh, in, in one fashion, and we're going to talk about how you might be able to leverage this approach with the Hive9 product. So here's what we know about dashboards. We know that value creators are, uh, we know all marketers are making dashboards. Some dashboards are being done as a, you know, click on a link inside a marketing automation system or a CRM system, up comes a report, right? That's not really the kind of dashboards the value creators are producing they're producing a different kind of dashboard and they're better at producing those kind of dashboards than their colleagues. So what's different about the dashboards of these A marketers? Well, one of the things is that's different. So if you look here, you can see they have gotten up to the far right corner of being able to monitor and measure the marketing objectives against the business outcomes. So they're not talking about activities, they're talking about objectives. They're able to actually track the performance of marketing strategies and processes. Again, not talking about campaigns, but talking about strategy and process. They're able to analyze the performance of the campaigns and the marketing activities. And you can see, so do the sales enablers, right? So uh, folks are able to do that. They're able to track marketing metrics in real time. They can communicate to the C-suite marketing's contribution to the business. And they're able able to use their dashboard, the C-suite's able to use the marketing dashboard to make business decisions. And the marketers are able to use the dashboard to secure additional resources, whether that's people or money, in order to move their um, efforts forward. So how do they do it? Well, they take that, uh, that chain that they created, right? They take the plan and the metrics chain that they created, and then they move that into a wireframe. So that's one of the things that we do out of the excellence methodology. So you go from the plan, now you have this wireframe. So you have the links going down the middle of your metrics. Now you have, can see how the money flows from the top to the bottom as well as bottom to the top. And then you can see the conversion or the movement. Not, we're not talking about conversion in the traditional sense of necessarily the pipeline, just the conversion or the movement uh, up the chain. And when you have that, now you can load that into a product such as Hive Nines and get an actionable dashboard. So is it really worth all the work that it takes to do something like this? Because I want to be honest, this isn't something that you're going to you know, leave this webinar and go I'll be able to do and poof, Monday morning after the weekend, you're done. It's going to take some energy and some effort and some investment. But is it worth it? Well, here's what we know. How important is the credibility and influence of your marketing organization? because the value creators who are doing this work are twice as, more, twice as credible and influential than their colleagues, campaign producers, and still more uh, influential and more uh, credible than their sales enablers. So how do you get started? Because that's really the challenge, right? Well, we know change is not easy, and this is a big change. We're saying forget those PowerPoints, forget those Excel documents. Start with a different, take a different approach. You know that old saying, uh, we all know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So that means change if you want different results. But alignment is really critical and it's too important to avoid and continue to put off. You have to start with business outcomes. And that means engaging in a different kind of conversation with your leadership team. And a lot of marketing folks have not had an opportunity to really practice that conversation. So get some help to help you practice that conversation. You have to select the right metrics. So while there are lots and lots of choices out there, many choices out there for metrics, because today there are so many tools and so many things we can measure that um, you know the sky's the limit nearly. So getting to the right ones is what's important, and that's why you want to have the alignment to help you do that. 
use your metrics to build an actionable dashboard. So as I'm closing my portion of this webinar, and again, thank you all for your attention, my, my comment to you is do one thing, take one idea, do it differently, do it now, because if you don't start doing it, you'll never start doing it. Thank you so much, you guys, for paying attention, and I'd like to turn it over to Johnny. Thanks, Laura. That was I, I learned something uh, every time I uh, listened to one of your talks. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, what I'd like to do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is really to talk about how you operationalize a marketing plan that uh, Laura talked about, one that starts with business outcomes and works down to marketing tactics and activities and then create a real-time feedback loop, the uh, aligned dashboard that Laura talked about to really enable marketers to make real-time adjustments to their plans. Everybody knows that marketing plans are not static, they are not built once at the beginning of the year and, and go on the shelf. Things change, uh, competitor, competitive landscape changes, new products come on to uh, the market uh, and uh, marketers need to be able to get a feedback mechanism uh, that compares what's really going on with their uh, with their plan against their forecast and be able to make really rapid pivots to that. Laura talked uh, uh, about starting the planning process with uh, business outcomes and then developing a plan planning framework uh, that aligns the activities investments with those outcomes and this is another example of the uh, uh, marketing planning uh, blueprint that Laura employs that really starts with business outcomes at the top and in this case it, it's really around a, a market development this one this example is flushed out a, a little more to show what it might look like in an enterprise environment where I've got a market development goal at the top of uh, corporately generating a hundred million dollars where marketing has a 20 percent uh, goal uh, for marketing contribution and then that goal is split to different marketing objectives by in this case by a business unit uh, and then Laura talked about being able to uh, attach strategies that are going to support that objective and in this case I've got uh, uh, an example of a couple of different strategies in the enterprise group Laura talked about personas and so this is a persona strategy for one group where in the mid market they may be going after an industry based strategy where they're tar targeting vertical industries and so this example flushes out uh, an industry based strategy in manufacturing that then then drives to um, programs that are uh, tar that support that strategy and that business objective and then at the bottom layer is really the tactics that are the tactic mix that's going to support support that program um, and so um, and then below that we're really going to start talking about it an activity level what are the things that you really need to do to, to be able to enable the specific tactic uh, that's going to support that strategy it starts really in in kind of uh, three pieces the first is really uh, defining what your uh, demand waterfall or revenue model looks like and this is a, a, a a, a part of the process that you can actually start early because you're going to use the demand waterfall metrics to help you build your blueprint. Uh, you need to be able to understand uh, how activities translate and convert to uh, different uh, outcome metrics and uh, ultimately to the uh, or the output metrics that, that then ultimately become the uh, uh, outcome metrics. And so in this case, there's a very simple three stage uh, waterfall. It's important every business is different and you really can't look at one waterfall for your entire business. You're going to have differences in conversion rates and deal sizes based off of vertical industries, geographies, solutions groups. Just the fact that you're going to have different conversion rates whether you're targeting new logos for existing products or you're trying to target a brand new market with new products. You're going to have a different conversion rate. So uh, this is a thing that's really going to enable us to predict what uh, the outcomes of our activities are going to be and is going to enable us to go through an iterative planning process to make sure that we're going to we're attaching enough budget and doing enough things to be able to hit the goals that are set at the top of the uh, uh, the uh, the blueprint. 
The next is really understanding uh, and planning um, around uh, 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 team collaboration and uh, uh, being able to attach budgets to um, to uh, uh, to different tactics, and then the last is really uh, getting approval for those specific uh, budget items and operationalizing your marketing systems um, to be able to integrate the plan with your uh, CRM systems, with your marketing automation systems, with your project management systems, where you may be tracking a lot of the activities that need to uh, that need to go on. So I talked a little about the uh, the uh, waterfall already. But um, it, it's just imperative that um, waterfalls uh, and revenue models are going to drive all of the predictive analytics that are going to enable you to know where you're, where you're going and uh, capturing the results against those. Most customers uh, uh, really, when they start to look at planning, plan in silos whether those are geographic silos or um, functional silos. And budgets may be set up the same way. And so um, having the ability to be able to plan against a set of objectives that are in a blueprint uh, that then stream down to the functional level and having a tool that enables you to look across those planning silos to see if you're going to hit your target or not is, uh, is a pretty important asset. When it comes to budget assignment, Laura and I talk about this constantly. We've had some pretty good conversations around this on whether you really start at the top and allocate budgets downstream to different objectives and to different strategies and to programs, or whether you do a, a, a bottoms-up budget approach, or whether it's a combination. So serious decisions recommends in their strategic budget allocation that percentage of budgets get assigned to different things. Whether you're doing a top-down, a bottoms-up, or a mix of that where you're rationalizing, you need to be able to have a, uh, the ability to attach um, planned budgets to specific tactics and roll those up so that you can see exactly what your planned customer acquisition cost is going to be and then be able to measure against that. And then on the planning side, then the, the next step is really to, uh, once you've got a plan that you've tweaked and played with and, and optimized the mix to get to the mix that it looks to be the most effective and the most cost efficient. The next is really getting the uh, approval and that is a, a workflow of a uh, 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 getting tactics approved, but more importantly, now starting to operationalize the uh, different systems that you've got. Marketing automation typically is handled in a silo, CRM is handled in a silo, project management is handling a silo. Being able to instrument those systems with metadata that's going to allow you to do reporting at a very tactical level on project completion, for example. Uh, and then being able to roll those back up and capture actual results out of those systems so that are going to are going to power your dashboard is just an extremely important element to that. And then last, the fourth step is really taking the wireframes that Laura talked about, where I'm taking metrics chains and turning those into actionable actionable dashboards. And I want to talk just a a little about uh, that. So as you look here. At this example, uh, these are three metrics chains that uh, Laura had in uh, talked about in a wireframe. On the left is a metrics chain around conversion, and that is based off of the blueprint that we designed. What were the conversions at each one of those steps, and are we on target or not on target? The second is really the uh, uh, the metrics for activities, um, output metrics, and um, uh, outcomes to really see whether we're on target or not on target. And then the last chain is really the financial chain that really looks at what uh, what my costs are relative to budget and and looking at what my uh, targeted customer acquisition costs are going to be. We're really looking, throwing analytics on top of this, and so there's a couple of key things that that um, uh, that are important to consider when you're building these kinds of things. So one is being able to integrate with data set with your uh, uh, operational data stores, whether that's marketing 
marketing CRM or other kinds of systems where you're bringing ERP systems, where you're bringing in budget, financial, and uh, activity metrics. But more importantly, being able to rapidly look to see if you're on target or off target on a specific metric. To be able to look to see if uh, a trend is either a trend that's up or down, and then to throw some analytics on that, really look at statistical relevance to see is this something that I should be concerned about or not. So in this case, you can see there's a uh, we're, we've got the three metrics changed with conversion rate and, and product adoption rate on the left, the total number of customers in the middle, and then the cost numbers on the right. And as we scroll down, we can see that, that we're moving downstream into the, in the blueprint and in the wireframe. So we're looking to see the interim kinds of metrics that we wanted to be able to track, whether that's proposals and quotes, conversations and meetings, could be things in different um, business units that could be in a high velocity uh, a blueprint, could be trial downloads, um, it could be numbers of different things that are the, the, the real uh, activities that are going to drive uh, engagement and drive conversions. And then down at the bottom is really the activities, is, is uh, you know, what are the things that marketing is going to do from an inbound demand creation standpoint, in this case, to entice people to take a, a, an assessment um, and look at both the conversion rates and the cost for those kind of assessments. So wrapping all of that together with being able to get alignment and accountability, aligning to the C-suite and aligning to uh, your sales counterparts, being able to create a plan that is based on business results and the real metrics that matter, uh, and then being able to communicate those in real time so that you can make quick pivots and optimize your marketing plans are just um, uh, extreme drivers for the best-in-class uh, value creators that Laura talked about. So in wrap up, we would just uh, invite you to, uh, if you're interested in having a conversation with Laura and I around kind of where you're taking your planning for 2016, we'd love to uh, set up a, a conversation with you. To um, uh, to uh, schedule a call with us, just email us at marketing at hive9.com and we'll find a time that works. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Manira and uh, open it up for some questions. Great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Johnny. Let's see. Uh, we have some questions coming in. Um, looks like first one's for Laura. How do we get started with this process? That's a great question because, you know, getting started is usually half the battle. Um, so the best way to get started is to decide you want to do it and then there are, we have a pretty well-defined uh, process if you want to, and uh, of course the application that we are sh sharing with you. Um, probably, you know, take Johnny up on the offer, have, and we'll have a conversation, and we'll help you get, figure out what makes the most sense and what the best next step is for you. Okay, uh, very good. Here's another one. Um, if we've already started on a plan, is it too late? Choose this approach. I, I think this is also for I want both, both of you, really. Well, it's never too late, right? I mean, if you already started, I mean, that doesn't mean that there might not need to be some, a little bit of rework, uh, especially if you started at the activity level and not the business outcome level. Might have to take a step back to go forward, but it's not too late. There's still time to do that. Johnny, what yeah, do you think? Yeah, I'd agree 100%. So uh, even if you're you know, we see a lot of marketing plans where people are taking last year's plan and putting a new date on it and using it for the next year. And, and like Laura said, it's all it's all activity based. So it's uh, uh, you know could be content creation, it could be display advertising, but it's not really changes to the website. Changes to the <laughs> website it could be those types of activities that uh, don't uh, uh, attach to business results. So. Being able to come back in and, and start having the discussion around business outcomes and creating that plan and then rationalizing the things that you've already built in your plan that might be activity based will give you a lot of insight on whether you're, you've got what we call a physics problem or not, whether you're doing enough stuff that's going to be able to, to hit the goal that uh, you've, you've negotiated with your CEO. You know, and kind of piggybacking onto that, when you go to a process like this, in a way you are signaling to your leadership 
team that you're going to do something different. And so if you think you're a campaign producer or an, a sales enabler and you want to move to becoming a value creator, you have to signal some way that there's change. And this helps you make that, helps you send that message. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, perhaps one more question um, before we uh, uh, we wrap up is how long will it take uh, to prove marketing's impact? This is a common question. A quarter, two quarters, more. Well, you want to take it. Um, I think we should take this one together. I think maybe that's an interesting question. How long does it take? I mean, without knowing what your plan is and what your timeline is and what your horizon is. That might be a little bit difficult, but how long it takes to actually put this process in place, I think we could answer that question. Now, you, we work with companies pretty quickly, and between Johnny, uh, I've not. It's dependent on your business, whether you've got a high velocity business. Um, I talked with a client yesterday that was already uh, able to see the impact, uh, a business impact on advertising they did during the World Series. Uh, that's an easy, uh, easy if you're getting the real-time feedback into your system, being able to, to show a marketing impact on, on revenue. If you've got a long sales cycle with a considered purchase that may be a 9, 12, 18 month sales cycle, you're really, your output metrics are going to be some of the predictive things. So you're going to be looking at the predictive things, which may be lower uh, in the blueprint because it's going to take you nine to 12 months to, for sales to close a deal. So by, by knowing that, you can look at the metric uh, that's the predictor metric that may have a shorter time horizon to be able to see what marketing's impact is. Without reverting back to things that we see marketers attached to from a metric standpoint, which is, I had this many web visits. And, you know, you that may be an indicator at the activity level, but it's not something the CEO wants to hear. Okay. Well, very good. Um, thank you all. Here's some information on how to stay in touch, um, some Twitter handles and uh, websites and so forth. I'm sure you can you can find us. Um, keep the conversation going. Um, email us, tweet at us, um, call, call us, and uh, we're happy to help because we, we're really passionate about exactly this. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.